Hey everybody, Captain Canuck here, and today we're doing a bit of a longer video and we're talking about smurfing. Now, Valve has been going wild lately, banning almost every pro player's smurf and presumably many more down the ranks. It's been a bit of a hot topic recently as pro players have been speaking out about their new queue times on their mains, and some popular boosting streamers have been completely blocked from playing. I've got a bunch of thoughts on this, and it's actually something I've been thinking about for years. This video is actually going to derive from an article that I wrote on the topic a while back. You can find that at my website down in the description. Now, in this article, I go over the reasons that harsh ban waves against Smurfs are not the silver bullet that game developers tend to think they are. I worked in game design for many years, and as game designers, we often talk about Smurfing as a problem to be eradicated. It's a festering underbelly with which we need to detect and eliminate, where the only problem to solving it is algorithmically figuring out who is and isn't a Smurf, and once we solve that, everything will be fine. However, I rather firmly believe that smurfing isn't necessarily a toxicity issue as much as it is a design problem, largely rooted in the ways that games handle things like matchmaking algorithms, ladder anxiety, and play between disparate skill groups. When players smurf, they're curating their experience. They're subverting an existing system because they're not satisfied with what that system produces. When I've seen pros and other Dota personalities weighing in on this lately, it feels like they're doing so with a perception that there is an inherent infallibility to Dota as a game and Valve as a whole. By saying, oh, a player smurf just because they want to stomp on noobs all the time because winning feels good, we suppose that MMR and true skill matchmaking is the end-all be-all of a good gaming experience. We suppose that the fairest and truest way for the game to be enjoyed is in a fair 50% forced environment where everyone has a perfectly equal chance to win, therefore implying that the only motivation to smurf is to break north of that 50%. I want to go into detail a little bit here and outline a few of the other reasons that people may smurf though, and talk about ways that Valve is failing and how they could improve their game for everyone, ideally driving smurf behavior down without needing these harsh band waves. So the first major topic we're going to talk about is queue times and MMR spread. Now, Valve used to do regular MMR resets, and they stopped. This used to be a thing where every six months, they would reset MMR, everyone would recalibrate and start over from basically scratch. There was some normalization there. But MMR used to top out at around 7 to 8k. I remember there being Reddit threads about the first 8k player, and now we're up to like 12 or 13 or some shit. The MMR scale is completely inflated. Players have gotten so far out of the bounds of the regular bell curve that we are thinning out to single-digit numbers of players at certain brackets, and the MMR system was just not designed for that. If these players that are at the very, very top end, the ones that are complaining on Twitter about their queue times, want to be matched regularly, they need to accept that if they want shorter queue times, they need to accept being matched with more players. Now, most want to have their cake and eat it, too. When match quality is bad, they're going to say, Oh, I'll wait an hour. I don't, I don't care. Just don't give me these dog shit games. And then when queue times are long, they'll say, Well, I don't care who I play. Just let me play Dota. And there's no winning. I worked on a league called Reach, and we did a custom matchmaking system for that league. And what we ended up doing was we actually had condensed queue windows where players would have to log in to play. You had to log in between 6 and 10 p.m. at night to be able to play on our platform. And by doing that, we enabled our queues to be populated because people knew when they had to show up to get good games. Right now, you've got tens of players that can be logically matched together at high ranks, and because Valve hasn't done any of this densification of the MMR system, they haven't done any resets, they haven't done any grooming of their spread on MMR, you now have this scenario where there just is nobody for them to match with. League of Legends had a similar situation where pros just had way too long match times, so what they implemented were actual pro servers that you can only play on if you've reached a certain rank, and those pro players know and coordinate when to show up and play so that there are populated games so that people can train and play on them. Valve needs to do something about the fact that pros and high rank players cannot find matches and cannot get quality matches reliably in order to solve this problem. Now the second major topic I wanted to talk about is competition and scouting. Grubby made a pretty poignant response to this issue today, and in it he called out the competitive factors that incentivize pro smurfing, namely hiding strats for tournaments. If everyone can see what you're practicing, you can't really get an edge in competitive play. 
Valve should take a hard stance on what constitutes fair obfuscation and scouting. Arkosh rather recently had a scandal where players were complaining that they couldn't be scouted because all the players on Arkosh were on alt accounts with no match history. Valve actually intervened there and exposed Arkosh's identities to the North American DPC teams, forcing them to be scoutable. Valve seems to be on the side of preferring that players' information be open and scoutable, as they've taken that side multiple times in the past. Like, there was that TI scandal where the caster's reference manual was leaked, and so they just gave it to everybody. They said, alright, well, if one team gets to scout everybody, then everybody does. However, pro players are going to want anonymity. It's been a common practice in almost every esport to play on anonymized accounts so that you can't be predicted. I'm looking at, like, StarCraft with, like, the barcode names and stuff. By removing smurfs, you step pro players back towards being predictable and easy to read in tournaments, and they're not going to like that. The more Valve forces that openness, the more likely I think you are to see pros looking for new ways to hide, either via in-house leagues or maybe unscored custom lobbies or something. They're going to want a way to play that doesn't expose what they're going through. Point number three that I want to talk about is rewards and casual play. Now, reward structures in games are a very important part of how people perceive themselves in the game and how they present themselves to the game community. People are precious about their ranks and their medals. There is a reason that if you look at a ranked MMR distribution graph, there is a plateau at the first rank of every MMR tier. People get to their new medal... And they feel that achievement. They get too scared to keep playing. They get precious about their metal. They want to keep it. They want to say, I'm a divine player. I'm an immortal player. And by putting emphasis on ranked and getting people on this idea that they could go pro in the game, they not only try hard in their games, but they seek to minimize losses wherever they can, particularly by outsourcing experimentation and off-meta play away from their precious ranking. There needs to be a better environment for casual play than unranked. Everyone knows that unranked is just ranked under the hood. You have an unranked MMR, the same as ranked, and because of that, you're going to play against tryhards of a similar level, no matter whether you care about the game or not. Part of why I think custom games have taken off in popularity, you know, like OMG 4 plus 2 or Overthrow or, or these games like that, is that you get a Dota-like experience with no matchmaking at all. There are no stakes, and therefore people feel at ease like they would on a smurf. This also applies to party matchmaking. Valve tinkered with the matchmaking of widely disparate parties a while back and made it so that the highest ranked party member determined what ranks you were matched against, making it very, very difficult to have an enjoyable party game. This resulted in a ton of people, myself included, smurfing just to have a fair party game where my teammates weren't getting eaten alive by a party full of immortals. I made a smurf account so that I could play with my girlfriend and we could enjoy unranked games together. And my win rate on that smurf is not ridiculous. It's like 52%. The fact that Valve felt like they needed to, you know, mess with this party algorithm made the it made the experience unenjoyable. If I play on my main account, my girlfriend gets stomped, we lose the majority of our games, and the experience is terrible. The fourth major point I want to talk about is disparate matches and their benefits. Now... I'm going to date myself a little bit with this one here, but in a time long, long ago, before MMR, we didn't have matchmaking. We didn't have MMR. We didn't have a rating system. We had lobbies. In games like Brood War, Command and Conquer, Counter-Strike, etc., you just joined a lobby with no indication of who was in it, and you played that person. And when I played those games, it was a rough start. When I played Command and Conquer 3, that was a game that I really wanted to take seriously, and I started out on a 46-game loss streak. I didn't win one game of online Command & Conquer in my first 46. Eventually, I won my first match on my 47th, and then I lost another string of 20, and then I won one more, and then I won one more, and it slowly built up, and eventually I got good enough that my win rate got above 50% as I got to be better than 50% of people I played against. Now, while this isn't an ideal experience and most people would consider that a pretty shitty time, what it did give me was a sense of accomplishment as my ranks grew and a much, much faster upward progression as my mistakes were ripped out of me with very little remorse rather than being accounted for by the system and placing me against people who made the same mistakes. Due to this, I gained a particular appreciation for getting my ass kicked. It made me better, and because of that, I actually found frustration when I was trying to go pro in Dota 
And I could not get that experience. I could not play against better players and have my mistakes exposed. In regular matchmaking games, you're playing against people that are making the exact mistakes you're making, and they're not punishing the mistakes that you do make, making it very hard to improve. If I had more control, I might have actually chosen to play against higher ranked players in Dota, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Why not allow players to play up or down from their skill bracket, maybe even just as a separate game mode? Give experienced players a place to play down and experiment like a smurf, while allowing aspiring tryhards and grinders a place to play up and have their mistakes exposed. It can make for a really interesting dichotomy between the two, and instead of allowing that interplay between players of disparate skill rankings on a voluntary basis, Valve is saying, hey, go smurf to get that experience if you want it. The fifth point I want to talk about is boosting. Now, I know a lot of people, a a lot of the problem in smurfing is boosting. You get a lot of people that just play Meepo and Huskar and Brood, and they just spam their way through the game as quick as possible so that they can boost an account to 6, 7, 8k, whatever, to sell it on a black market for 30 bucks or whatever it happens to be. But a lot of this is done for monetary value. You have massively talented players, often living in third world countries where the American dollar means a lot more. There may be 9, 10, 11k players. And the only way that they have to monetize their talent is by selling accounts to people who wish that they could play above their skill like I described above. In a talk in 2013 at the University of Texas, Gabe Newell talked about how they were looking at ways that Valve could allow their users to monetize their passions, either by creating skins in the game or by distributing fan art. And at one point, he made this point about the banner system that existed for pro teams early in Dota's lifespan. He talked about how Dendi and Navi were able to monetize their skill by selling these banners, which represented the entertainment value that they brought to fans. And it seems weird to me that this thought process doesn't exist in dealing with high-profile boosters and streamers. These are players that have put thousands of hours into getting good at the game so that they can monetize their skill, and they do it through Twitch, and they're very entertaining for quite a wide audience. They have a lot of viewers. But the only path to do so, to monetize this, is through a black market. It's through selling off-platform, it's through selling accounts and violating terms of use. I'm not suggesting that Valve allow account sales, but why not put more effort into the in-game coaching system? Why not create a market for Dota education and guidance? Allow boosters to become mentors and educators in a much more lucrative way than selling high-ranked accounts to overconfident scrubs at what equates to less than minimum wage in most first world countries. Like, people could make bank if there was an official and and enforced coaching system within the game, and Valve kind of went halfway with it, but then they stopped. And because of this, you have boosters running wild in this black market that you've you've essentially created. Finally, the sixth point I want to make is just other value that can be provided that's missing. There are a lot of ways that Valve could provide the experience that a Smurf gives in a much cleaner environment. I've played a lot of Rocket League, and the Smurf problem in that game was largely due to mid to high ranked players wanting to try to learn sophisticated maneuvers like air dribbles, flip resets, and other stuff like that. And they didn't want to do it in their ranked games because they'd get yelled at by their teammates. So what they did was they took this into Smurf accounts, did it against low-ranked players, and and they didn't care. Down the line, Psyonix added workshop map support, which opened the doors to a lot of creative training maps, which ultimately reduced the number of people air dribbling in my 1v1s. They allowed people to kind of practice through these obstacle courses, and in these custom uh, custom arenas. And because of that, there was a much better training tool than just playing against a live opponent who doesn't know how to handle it. They weren't looking for the satisfaction of beating a noob. They were looking to practice, and the practice tools that existed at the time were shit. When Psyonix improved those, the numbers of Smurfs in 1v1s dropped quite a bit. Now, similarly, allowing people to find better ways to train their different types of dota people are in different moods in the game they want to play competitive sometimes sometimes they want to play casual and goofy sometimes they want to be really social but not serious they want to do in-houses and stuff why was why does dota not put more effort into catering to these mindsets why is there not a a more social way to create an in-house through a guild or something like that i think if you were able to you know, get that mindset and create tools and environments for it, you could do much more to put a dent in the Smurf population than you would through these ban waves. 
Now, in conclusion, this is my final point. I just think Valve needs to reevaluate why there's so many Smurfs in their game. There's a lot of legitimate reasons why players may seek to curate their game experience, and not all of them are just power tripping. While there might be a handful of players that are just legitimately out there stomping people to feel better about themselves by smacking low-ranked kids, I'd wager that far more feel alienated or intimidated by the modes and options that are offered in the base game, and they're looking for something else. I think some definitive research into players' motivations would go a lot further for Valve than just slamming their core audience with harsh bans. That's my opinion. That's what I've got. I want to know what you guys think down below. Do you think that Valve is justified in banning all the Smurfs the way that they did? Should pro players have an exception due to their high queue times and competition? Do you agree with players like Grubby and Celery and, and others that have been kind of complaining about the state of things? And what other reasons have you had to maybe resort to Smurfing that weren't covered here? I mean, I think there's a lot of them out there. And I think there's a lot of legitimate use cases for Smurfing that Valve really isn't addressing. Do you have any that I haven't really covered? Let me know in the comments down below. Either way, thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. You're all beautiful. I will catch you in the next one. I've been Captain Canuck, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.